Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to a new edition of the Indian Express Explained Live, our series of online explanatory conversations with domain experts and authorities on specific subjects. I am Monojit Majumdar, editor for explanatory journalism at the Indian Express. Today, as you know, we are discussing China, where the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party has just confirmed Xi Jinping as supreme leader for the third term. Xi, who was probably already the most powerful leader of China since Deng Xiaoping or maybe even Mao Zedong, now has a Politburo and a Politburo Standing Committee, which is packed with his loyalists, and he can now cast China in his own image, perhaps even more than what he could earlier. Now, what does this situation mean for India and for the world? What can be expected from Xi's China in the coming years? To answer some of these questions and to generally explain the deep complexities and the, the enormous importance of the India-China relationship, we are delighted to have with us here, Mr. Vijay Gokhale, former foreign secretary and India's former ambassador to China, and who is probably among the best informed and most thoughtful commentators on the subject in India currently. Mr. Gokhale, thank you for your time. We are very grateful to you, sir. Thank you, Manujit and Shobhajit for inviting me uh, on your show. Speaking to Mr. Gokhale will be my colleague, Shobhajit, who Mr. Gokhale just mentioned, who has been writing about China and about India's strategic affairs and international relations for many years now. You can read all of Shubhajit's reporting on our website, www.indianexpress.com, and you can also listen to him on the excellent Indian Express podcast, Three Things. Today's Explained event is brought to you by our associate partner, Yojana IS. My thanks, as always, to our partner. And thank each one of you for joining, and welcome once again. Shubha. Thank you. Thank you, Monajit. Uh, it is indeed a privilege to host Mr. Vijay Gokhale who I've known for several decades. And uh, it's fair to say that, you know, outside the Indian government, uh, if there is one person who understands contemporary China best, it is Mr. Gokhale. Uh, Mr. Gokhale, he has served uh, as a diplomat in China from different vantage points, from Hong Kong, from Taiwan and Beijing. He also uh, uh, has covered or, and handled the India-China relationship in New Delhi in the Ministry of External Affairs as a joint secretary, as the key person uh, who has uh, you know, uh, negotiated with India on border issues, on all the bilateral issues concerning India and China uh, relationship. Uh, so thank you, uh, Mr. Gokhale, once again, for joining us. Uh, on this topic, let me, you know, go straight in into this topic. Uh, and uh, Mr. Gokhale has written, since you've written so extensively on this, on China, with your three books uh, coming out in the last couple of years, um, uh, I wanted to go straight right in uh, with Xi Jinping as a man, as a leader. Now, she was born in political elite and uh, his father was a, a fairly senior communist leader uh, but very soon his father fell out uh, with Mao and uh, she became the son of a disgraced leader. Uh, many years later when China's sort of communist party, the big leaders of the party, they chose him but they thought that he could be controlled. Uh, but he has obviously proved them wrong. Uh, so Gokhale, you have really seen Xi Jinping's trajectory uh, over the last four decades. Uh, if you could take us through, uh, you know, Mr. Xi's, Xi Jinping's, uh, his trajectory, his long arc to the leadership position uh, for, for our viewers. Uh, yeah, thank you, Shobhajit. Um, it would be difficult for anybody to say they know Xi Jinping, although he has actually been in politics for four decades. Because uh, in these four decades, 
he has always stayed below the radar. And that is one of his strong points and a hallmark of his political career. The other important uh, hallmark is that very early on, after the end of the Cultural Revolution, when many of the leaders and their children were rehabilitated, Xi Jinping chose to move away from the limelight in the capital city, Beijing, and serve instead in provincial appointments and in rural counties. And that is where Xi Jinping stayed from 1983 until 2007 when he came to Beijing. In other words, he cut his teeth at the grassroots of Chinese politics. He stayed away from the limelight and from overtly taking sides with any faction. And therefore, when he came to the center in 2007, he came as a relatively unknown figure, which helped him because ultimately politics in any country, and China is no different, is all about balance of political forces and acceptable political personalities. And Xi Jinping fitted this very well. Now, of course, once he came to the center in 2007, uh, he was very much in the spotlight for five years during the second term of General Secretary Hu Jintao. Again, uh, during these five years, there was not a step that he put wrong. He essentially stuck to the party line, showed loyalty to the Supreme Leader, the General Secretary of the Communist Party, Hu Jintao, and contrasted his own actions with the actions of another rising star, Po Shi Lai, who was also the son of one of Mao's close comrades, and who eventually became so threatening to the party because they thought that he was another Mao Zedong, that when it came time to make a choice, she became the automatic candidate. So in a sense, uh, Xi Jinping through his long career was uh, somebody who uh, kept his personality hidden. And it is only when he assumed the office of general secretary in 2012 November that, he, that the various facets of his personality began to unfold. And I would hazard the guest, Shubhadi, uh, Shubhajit, that there weren't too many people either inside or outside China which could quite fathom what sort of leader Xi Jinping would eventually become when he was selected to become the top leader in November 2013 at the 18th Party Congress. Right. Uh, well, Mr. Gukli, you know, she's sort of stint in Zhejiang province as party secretary in 2002, uh, sort of put him in parties uh, uh, central sites. You know, you uh, also have talked about earlier about how uh, she was when he he was uh, his brief stint in Shanghai uh, also tested his metal where it was both a political prize and a, sort of a hotbed of corruption. Now, uh, if you could take us through those those times, how it developed him as a leader before he was sort of named or handpicked for the top job? He was uh, fortunately placed in two provinces, Fujian province, which is a coastal province opposite Taiwan, and Chechiang province, which is arguably either the richest or the second richest province of China, at a time when China was opening up to the outside world. So in a sense, he had a first-hand experience uh, he, in, in one sense, sat at the table when discussions were taking place with foreign countries and foreign companies on investment. And when the provinces in China were in competition among themselves as to who could best attract that foreign talent, technology and investment. So to that extent, uh, Xi Jinping was able to get deep insights into the entire process of decision making within the Chinese political system, as well as see the benefits of allowing the provinces to compete amongst themselves so that the economy of the country developed. He also, however, used his time in these two provinces. He was governor of Fujian and subsequently the party secretary of Shanghai 
to build up loyalty among his subordinates. And today, many of those who uh, share power with him are known within China as the new Churchyang army. These were all uh, subordinates who served under him or colleagues who were with him in Churchyang province or in Fujian, and they are fiercely loyal to him. So in a sense, uh, what he essentially did was build up both a political base in two very prominent provinces of China and imbibe as much experience as he could in governance, both in terms of rural and in terms of urban development. And overall, I think this stood him in good stead. His term in Shanghai, of course, was very brief. It was only a, a brief period of seven months. But Shanghai is known as the cradle uh, for many Chinese leaders. In fact, uh, uh, from 1949, with a single exception of Chen Liang Yu, who was convicted for corruption, every party secretary of Shanghai has eventually made it to the Politburo and the Politburo standing committee. So in a sense, appointing him to Shanghai was a signal of very good things to come in the future. Nonetheless, it was a, a dangerous place to be in 2005, 2006. And he had to very carefully maneuver himself uh, because this was the stomping ground of former General Secretary Chang Zemin, who carried considerable political influence in 2007. And therefore, there was always the possibility that if he put a wrong step, his career would come to a full stop. So in a sense, he has learned politics at the grassroots and he has always uh, tried to understand the system as he has risen to power. And uh, of course, that eventually led him to the top spot in the Communist Party. One aspect of his sort of upbringing of, or of his life is that, you know, as a, as a young she, as a teenager, he was sent to uh, the rural parts of uh, China. You know, his, his father became disgraced. Uh, but despite his hardships, he managed to retain faith in the party. Uh, what, uh, I mean, how do you explain this uh, uh, part of his personality? Well, uh, children of many top guarders were sent down to the rural areas as part of Mao's cultural revolution. Uh, Xi Jinping, of course, was not an exception in this case. Uh, the children of Deng Xiaoping, the former president Liu Xiaoqi, uh, uh, as well as a whole host of leaders, families were also sent down. But she was exceptionally, uh, 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 was an exception in the sense that he utilized this time to test out certain core views and to shape his own belief in the system. Uh, he himself admitted in an interview, which he gave sometime in the year 2000, that initially he was, he felt uh, angry and upset at being sent to the uh, provinces, to the rural areas and in fact ran away to Beijing. But when he returned to the countryside, he made up his mind to see this in a positive way, although it was a period of great hardship for him. He in fact lived in a cave uh, for much of that time. Uh, and essentially what he did was try to take leadership of that small village and the village commune. Uh, you see in his interview, which he gave in 2000, how he uses his intellectual abilities, his knowledge of history, his knowledge of the party, uh, in order to mold the views of people in the village and eventually to win the favor of the village party chief. Indeed, it is the village party chiefs who were subsequently responsible for recommending his name for admission in the university, even though at that time, he was still the son of a fallen leader and therefore, in some disgrace. Uh, the lesson I take away from this is that Xi Jinping has a great ability to win the support of others to his cause, right to his political career, but without himself taking sides or becoming part of any faction. And it is essentially this duality 
the capacity to build grassroots support for him without him attaching himself to anybody else which really explains the rise of this this very phenomenal rise of a leader who until 2007 nobody had really heard of outside china right uh, you pointed out i mean how he never overtly aligned and sort of shown patience self confidence and discipline uh, all these years and uh, he obviously believes that the communist party uh, is the rightful ruler of china and that he's best qualified uh, to lead it now the way i wanted to take you to uh, the next aspect of how he controls the party now you know uh, you've written in your book in after tiananmen the rise of china about how the collapse of the soviet union uh, weighed heavy on his mind uh, there is a there is a paragraph where he uh, told a meeting that uh, you know cpsu which is the the soviet union uh, communist party of soviet union that as great a party as it was scattered like a flock of frightened bees uh, he uh, his strategy to uh, to control the party if you could tell us what are the ways what was his uh, ways he uh, what are the things that he pursued from ideology to discipline to corruption if you could take us through his strategy to control the party it's important to understand shubhaji that uh, if we are to assume that he has tried to control the party purely for the purposes of consolidating personal power then that is uh, only a partial understanding of the man and of the leader uh, it, we need to understand the context in which he assumed the top job after 20 years of reform from 1990 many good things had happened in china including spectacular economic growth and dramatic improvement in the lives of the people but it was also becoming evident that the reform and opening up policies had a darker underside that darker underside was essentially the weakening of ideology and of discipline within the party as money power replaced ideology in politics and also the consequent uh, corruption that arose the graft and corruption that arose along with the economic boom and by 2012 although to the outside world china was performing spectacularly while the rest of the world was struggling with the global financial crisis the chinese leadership knew very well that there were deeply troubling developments which were going to impact not only economically in china but politically as well and xi jinping assumes the top job in these situated in this situation and under these circumstances he was therefore very well aware when he assumed office that these problems were likely to dilute the communist party's grip on power and that eventually if that grip weakened beyond the point the party itself would slip from power uh, and therefore that speech he gave in january 2013 within months of assuming the top job comparing what happened to the soviet union in 1990 with the situation in china in 2012 is very important and he made two or three very critical points in that speech the first is to point out to his party that when you deny the history of the party then the rot starts to set in uh, and he pointed to the fact that the criticism that khrushchev made of stalin uh, was the point at which the soviet union's uh, the party of the communist party of the soviet union's real political authority began to weaken because if you could criticize stalin then the soviet people began to ask why you could not criticize any other people the second important point he made was that when the soviet union was on its last legs the red army which was supposed to be the, the party's army did not come to its support the party collapsed because the army did not loyally come to its support and therefore the second message was that it is important to rebuild the institutions within the party 
including the party's control over the people's liberation army because otherwise if this did not happen then the party's military wing and protector might turn against it and the third important point he was making was that ideology is important and it cannot be substituted by pragmatic policies of reform and opening up he fully understands that reform and opening up has brought a lot of prosperity to the people but he still thought there was necessary for a certain glue to hold together the party and the country and he recognized the value of ideology so essentially if you understand the context in which he assumed power then you have to also understand his mindset which is that if he did not do anything about these problems then it is possible that the party might collapse on his watch and therefore you have a combination of personal power as well as a longer term vision for the party which comes together and he acts on uh, these forces and therefore as i said you cannot simply understand this as a grab for personal power uh, the manner in which he set about it was threefold he reinforced the centrality of ideology in the communist party and he did this by contrasting marxism leninism and chinese uh, socialism with western democracy and other values suggesting that the western values were not only not conducive to chinese environment but were designed to bring down the communist party and therefore to weaken the chinese people so the centrality of ideology and particularly of socialism with chinese characteristics was brought back into the discourse uh, the second thing he did was to bring in new rules of party discipline uh, he felt that the gradual decentralization of authority which had taken place at the top levels because there was no single dominant leader had led to various central and provincial leaders pulling in different directions and that this eventually was not good for the party so a whole new set of rules were brought in to control uh, uh, individualism within the party and to reinforce the centrality of the central leadership and in that central leadership to in, uh, to highlight his own centrality as the and of course lastly he resorted to a tactic that many of his predecessors had resorted to which was to use anti corruption measures as a means of dealing with political opponents and therefore uh, he used uh, these anti corruption campaigns to uh, basically um, sort of bring down people who were his rivals in the politburo or who were very powerful in the military forces or in the internal security apparatus both as a way of reinforcing his own control and sending a message to others that uh, there would be no longer uh, such a liberal atmosphere that would would allow them to build their own bases or to create their own factions uh, so this is essentially what we have seen uh, in the past 10 years that he has taken over us after he has taken over his leader right so the anti corruption campaign that he launched was obviously uh, not new but uh, you know were mostly used to catch people who indulged in petty corruption and not the highly corrupt uh, 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 people in the party uh, but she changed that game she saw this saw these highly corrupt uh, leaders as a threat both to the party and his power if you could take us through how he sort of took this into account and what he did during his first uh, uh, two terms well he gave fair warning of it in his very first speech which he delivered when he was introduced to the public as the new leader of china uh, like it last sunday when he appeared on stage with six other leaders in the same manner he had appeared on stage in november of 2013 and in that speech he highlighted the problem of corruption and said he intended to do something about it now understandably uh, china had seen many anti corruption campaigns 
and therefore presumed that this was simply a way of the new leader to clean house and essentially to reinforce his authority as the new supreme leader of China. And therefore, little attention was paid to the various uh, efforts that he made to investigate and bring corrupt officials to justice. Uh, it initially began with uh, investigations into those top leaders or former leaders who had helped his rival, Ho Xi Lai, uh, attempt a coup d'etat in, uh, or a, a supposedly a coup d'etat in uh, the summer of 2013, the summer of 2012. Uh, and again, uh, to some extent, many other Chinese leaders felt that this was understandable and therefore were not concerned. It was only when he moved, started to move against serving officials in the military, in the internal security apparatus, and in the party, uh, and started developing a number of mechanisms uh, in, to, to, to investigate and bring them to trial, that the party began to realize that this was not simply uh, a, a normal political captain but a very sustained effort at consolidating his personal power and his authority as the supreme leader over the party. Uh, now, uh, the, the beauty of it is that he has been able to do so largely with the support of his colleagues. But subsequently, of course, a number of these colleagues have themselves become the center of, uh, 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 of investigation. Uh, and in his own words, uh, he has said, I think in 2014 or 2015, that the cage around the party members had become old and weak and he needed to rebuild that cage. Now, essentially, that rebuilding has been done in two ways. Firstly, to tighten the, the rules of party discipline, uh, which are now uh, uh, vast enough to encompass not only what the party member says and does, but also what his family members say and do. In other words, the net of party discipline has been cast over not just the member, but his, his or her families as well. And therefore, it's a much wider net. Uh, the second thing he, of course, did was to change some of the key rules, uh, which uh, in Deng Xiaoping's time had allowed for a division of responsibilities and powers at the top. Uh, he, he basically reversed that process, uh, stating that, uh, the, that you had to have a centralized and unified leadership under one leader to govern China because uh, the old method that Deng Xiaoping had put into place had resulted in what, in Xi Jinping's own words, are a watered down leadership. Uh, these were the words he, in fact, used at the 20th Party Congress. Uh, and therefore, uh, you see a centralization of authority in him, as well as greater political controls and disciplinary uh, measures against the party members. And in a sense, he has said, uh, he has done what he has said, which is building a new cage around the party members in order to ensure that they stay in mind. Right. Uh, the other aspect about him is that uh, this Xi Jinping thought that he has established himself as the core and is thought as the guiding doctrine for the country. Uh, now, she thought, Xi Jinping thought is compulsory reading across the party, government, military, in universities and schools. Uh, how did he arrive at that thought and what does that mean for, uh, for China? Well, in the Chinese uh, communist system, and indeed for that matter, the communist system in general, ideology is obviously central to that. Uh, and while Marxism, Leninism was in a sense the guiding ideology, uh, Mao Zedong, who was China's first leader, never subscribed to the Leninist approach that revolution has to be made in the cities and among the workers. Mao, in fact, said that the revolution would be made in the rural parts of China with the peasant army. And in a sense, he, his revolution was very different from Lenin's revolution in 1970. And therefore, uh, the individual thought of the Chinese leader 
was deemed important enough to enter into the lexicon of ideology and hence Mao introduced the whole idea of Marxism, Leninism and Mao Zedong. Now, of course, subsequently, all Chinese leaders have wanted to emulate that. And therefore, whenever they come up with a broad political framework, uh, they try to include this in the party's constitution as their ideological contribution to the party. So in the case of Deng Xiaoping, it is called Deng Xiaoping theory. In the case of uh, 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 Chang Zemin, it is called the three represents and so on and so forth. Uh, and each of these enters the constitution in some manner as an ideological contribution that the top leader of the time has made to the whole idea of the evolution of Chinese communism. The important difference between all these contributions and Xi Jinping's contribution is that aside from Mao, none of the other top leaders were able to get their uh, ideological uh, uh, framework into the constitution when they were in power. In the case of Deng, Chiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao, these changes were made to the party constitution after they had debated office. So the assumption in this case is that uh, by getting his uh, ideology or framework recognized in the party's constitution, he is in a sense placing himself uh, at par with Mao Zedong. Uh, that's the first point. The second, of course, is that there is a very personal angle to this, which is that uh, it reinforces the power and position of the single leader in China. Uh, because Xi Jinping thought mandatorily becomes part of everything. It becomes a part of the education curriculum. It becomes a part of military training and doctrine. It becomes a part of the party's um, uh, actions. It becomes a part of parliamentary practice, the National People's Congress practice. And therefore, it becomes almost obligatory to include Xi Jinping thought in any law, regulation, procedure, uh, or framework that you devise. And that, in a sense, reinforces the identity of the top leader. And that is why Xi Jinping thought is important. Uh, the final point is, uh, the, the, the way in which this Xi Jinping thought has developed uh, again indicates that he wants to distinguish his era, his, his time in power, uh, from uh, the period of his predecessors. Now, that is much more difficult in the current situation because in the case of Mao, he was, uh, it was a peasant rebellion which eventually became the state and therefore there was a clear contribution that Mao made in terms of class struggle, for instance. Uh, or in terms of uh, a, 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 a rural revolution. Uh, similarly, Deng Xiaoping uh, could also make a great contribution because the whole concept of reform and opening up led to that enormous prosperity that we see in China today. In the case of Xi Jinping, however, uh, there was no such sort of path-breaking idea. And therefore, uh, to my mind, and this is of course only my view, uh, and it is subject to, uh, you know, uh, arguments by others, is that he has cobbled together a set of rather prosaic achievements and, uh, uh, and doings and happenings into a sort of coherent or uh, attempted coherence and an ideology and is packaged it as Xi Jinping thought. But if you really go to the core, the message is that China needs a centralized, unified leadership under a dominant leader who will be the guide for uh, all policy, whether it is domestic or foreign, and that uh, the people of China should trust in him and in his ideology uh, because he has pledged to take China closer to the center of the world stage, which is double speak for, uh, we will replace the United States as the global hegemon by 2049, or at least we shall attempt to do that. Right. She, uh, I mean, has used uh, versions of history, historical analysis uh, to serve the party as well as his personal ambitions. Uh, I mean, he has uh, shown that, you know, the central point has been that history is not simply an intellectual exercise and uh, its proper handling is necessary for political survival. 
Now, he has used this sort of narrative of China that has been subjected to bullying in the past and humiliation in the past to sort of craft an assertive and even aggressive foreign and national security policy. Uh, I wanted you to sort of tell us how he's done that, this use of history uh, in his thought. Uh, you know, Shubhajit, all history is political, irrespective of where you live in the world. And as a student of history, because my, in, my, in the university I studied history, uh, it was quite evident to me that every dynasty in India and abroad essentially used history to legitimize itself. So to that extent, what Xi Jinping is doing is no different from what every other uh, political system has done uh, through history. Uh, what is important, however, is that Xi Jinping has used a certain historical narrative uh, which predated the Communist Party, which is that China was humiliated by outside forces and its greatness, its glory, its leadership of the world was diminished as a result. That sense of humiliation and sense of deprivation that the Chinese people felt was skillfully appropriated by the communists to suggest that only they could restore the Chinese people to their rightful place in the world. And Xi Jinping has essentially used history to reinforce this message. Uh, he is now helped by the fact that his, due to the policies followed by his predecessors, China has both the economic heft and the military muscle to move towards that objective. And therefore, what you see under Xi is a combination of that economic uh, power, the military capability, and the concept or idea that China will return now to the center of world politics. Uh, and therefore, uh, history is important for him as part of governing principle. But of course, it is also important to bear in mind that history is personal to him because he is the son of one of China's top pre-revolutionary and revolutionary leaders. His father was a close comrade of Mao Zedong, had fought in the revolution, was a political commissar in the, in the, uh, in the People's Liberation Army, uh, subsequently had been the deputy prime minister or vice premier of China, and therefore he was a participant in that history. He was not simply an onlooker. So what you see is both a history as a political tool and history as a very personal subject. And when they come together, it is, uh, 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 it is uh, you know, that coming together that it explains the way in which Xi Jinping uses history uh, uh, to reinforce his power. And one of the key elements uh, is his message, which he gave in January 2013, when he talked of the Soviet Union's collapse. His main point there was, when the party denies its own past history, then you are sowing the seeds for uh, the party's collapse. And the subtext, of course, therefore, is to his party members is, there is no need to question the past. We have already settled it in various history resolutions that the party has, has, has adopted. And therefore, reopening past wounds uh, will actually damage the party with no real political achievement. So I think uh, the central message has been, we have already worked out the past, Let's move forward on the basis of uh, Xi Jinping thought and the guidance that the central leader is now giving. So uh, she has, as you have explained, has a very sinocentric view of the world. And uh, it only considers uh, uh, US, America as its equal. Um, it, it looks at the rest of the world through the prism of uh, this balance of power politics. So um, as uh, someone who's watched his uh, national and foreign security policy develop, how do you see his, uh, this thought uh, going further as he's now got a third term? I think what we are going to see is a more assertive uh, and even uh, some might say a more aggressive China. Uh, some of this is, of course, entirely explainable by the fact that 
when you have an 18 trillion dollar economy, uh, particularly one that is heavily dependent on external trade and uh, import of resources and energy, uh, you do want to exercise authority and power at a regional and global level that secures our interests. But beyond that, uh, I think there is, and there always has been, a subterranean uh, concern within China. I'm not saying whether it is justified or not. That's a subject for a, for a future debate. Uh, about the determination of the West to subvert the Communist Party's rule and to bring China back in a weakened state into the liberal Western or, uh, global order, uh, in hopefully converting China into a democracy or a Western style democracy. Now, whether or not this is the objective of the West is another matter. But what is certainly true is that this is the perception within the Chinese Communist Party and its top leadership. So what we are increasingly seeing is a sense developing within the Communist Party of the United States now posing an existential threat to it. And recent Chinese, uh, uh, excuse me, recent American uh, maneuvers and moves with President Trump and subsequently with his successor, President Biden, has only reinforced the sense that America is out to get China. So uh, what we are seeing uh, is uh, a gradual polarization taking place there and a more uh, 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 rivalrous or adversarial relationship developing. And on both sides, it is becoming structural. In other words, it is not something that can be simply resolved by one or two or a few meetings between leaders. It is see, uh, each sees the other as a threat on many pillars, not just on the national security pillar, but on the economic pillar, on the technological pillar, in the maritime pillar, in, in terms of outer space, in terms of cyber. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, we can. Uh, my my sense is that the 19 uh, that the 2020s is going to be a decade of uh, heightening competition and rivalry across the board between these two uh, great powers. Now, uh, the consequence is going to be that while the world is certainly becoming multipolar, and India uh, is also one of those poles, what I expect in the next 10 years is a multipolar world with a strong bipolarity. Uh, because frankly, the economic heft and the military capabilities that the United States and China exhibit are far, far greater than any other pole can possibly exhibit in the next 10 to 12 years. Uh, the situation will change, of course, uh, post-2035 uh, in the sense that uh, India will uh, economically be in a much stronger position. A number of other countries are also rising. Uh, we, we have to see what happens with the European Union uh, and so on and so forth. But for the next 10 years, certainly, uh, my sense is it is a multipolar world with strong bipolar features. Right. Uh, one of the things in the CCP that we saw were the personal changes, uh, and they're significant. But they also point to the fact that she has complete political control as it's packed them with loyalists. You also saw these dramatic visuals of uh, uh, Hu Jintao, former president, former general secretary of the party, being escorted out. The, the, some say it's the, he was uh, unwell. Some say he was ushered out. Uh, what, what uh, if you could give us a sense of the new members that have who have come in. Also the next premier, because Li Keqiang will be uh, out of uh, the, the government uh, in the next, uh, next, after March. So if you could uh, give us a sense of what do these personal changes mean? Uh, Shubhajit, personal changes are important, but we will be missing the uh, forest for the trees if we don't understand the second part of the point you made, which is that what we should take away from this is that Xi Jinping is in command of Chinese politics today. Uh, we should also be careful, however, in assuming that they are all the king's men. Because uh, over the course of 30 or 40 years in politics, you develop 
friendships, uh, 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 alliances of convenience, or ideological convergences with more than one person and more than one group. Uh, and I think that, that we simply do not know enough about the internal workings of the Chinese Communist Party to make a judgment as to whether the other six members on the new Politburo Standing Committee are all she's men. What we do know from the reading of Chinese communist history is that there have that factions have always existed within the Communist Party, and that it has always been the, the leader's uh, sort of uh, struggle to control or eliminate those factions. Even Mao uh, was confronted with factions, and the great proletarian cultural revolution was, in a sense, his effort to reinstate control when he felt that factional politics was slipping out of control. Therefore, to presume that what was uh, the fact under Mao, Deng, and his successors about there being factionalism within the Communist Party, to presume that this is not the case with Xi Jinping would, I think, be, uh, from my perspective, premature because we simply do not have enough information about these six new people. As far as the premiership is concerned, uh, it should be, uh, should be, I think it's important to note that while Li Qiang, uh, the former party secretary of Shanghai, is now uh, the number two person in the party after Xi Jinping. Uh, and it is speculated that he will be the prime minister. It is not necessary that he will be. Uh, for instance, in the 90s, uh, the premier of the state council was the third ranking leader after general secretary Chiang Zemin and the chairman of the National People's Congress, Li Peng. And therefore, uh, uh, it has not always been the case uh, or practice that the number two leader is the premier. However, according to most pundits and to uh, uh, and those who are observers, keen observers of personal issues, uh, they tend to think that Li Qiang, who was the party secretary of Shanghai, will be the next premier of the state council. If that happens, of course, uh, you have a leader who has not earlier served uh, as an understudy to the Prime Minister. Uh, the previous several Prime Ministers, Li Keqiang, the current Prime Minister, Wen Jiapao, the Prime Minister before him, and Chu Rongji, the Prime Minister before Wen Jiapao, were all executive vice premiers for a period of three to five years before they assumed the top job. And they therefore understood the mechanics of administration uh, and governance. Uh, Li Qiang comes straight from the provinces. This, of course, does not mean that he may not be capable enough to handle the job. I'm simply pointing out that uh, uh, he uh, is, has come uh, from a different route than the previous premiers of the state council. And there is, I guess, speculation in the Western media that this will have some kind of an impact on governance. Uh, the fact of the matter, however, is that he has held important positions in a number of provincial governments. And therefore, he is not lacking in administrative experience. Right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Gokhale. I'll now move to questions from the audience. There are plenty of questions in the chat box, as well as we have some callers who uh, want to ask you questions. Uh, so uh, first question comes from Bimla Sharma. If you could unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, sir, I have a question. Is the promotion of the free India border command general to a top PLA force a message to India and the world that China's peaceful rise is finally over and the world is going to a key mode of the Chinese world warrior diplomacy? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bimlaji. I think that the, uh, uh, the word peaceful rise uh, is a, 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 a phrase that was briefly coined, not by the current leader, but by his predecessor, Hu Chitao. Uh, and the idea of that phrase was essentially to convey the idea that as China rose in the global system, it would not upset the balance of power. Uh, very soon, however, the, the then leadership 
in 2004 and 2005 realized that the word rise itself might imply some threat, something of a threat uh, or something of a challenge. And therefore, they removed this phrase from their lexicon, from their usual statements, and replaced it with harmonious development. Uh, at no stage have the Chinese ever said that uh, by peaceful rise, they mean they will never use military or quasi-military means to achieve their objectives. If the rest of the world interpreted peaceful rise in, the, in that manner, then perhaps the rest of the world needs to introspect on why they bought into this phrase. Uh, the fact of the matter is that China has always used force or threat of force as a pressure point uh, when its core interests in their view have been threatened, whether it is the American uh, invasion of South Korea in 1950, uh, whether it is the US intervention in Vietnam in the 1960s, uh, whether it is uh, what they perceived as uh, India's uh, threat in 1962 or Vietnam's activism in 1979, uh, the Chinese have never hesitated to use uh, military measures in a controlled fashion. And uh, therefore, uh, I think uh, we should be prepared for more of that. Uh, that does not, of course, mean that uh, China is contemplating a full-scale conflict, uh, but it does mean that a more realistic view has to be taken uh, of China and of its capacity to use force uh, in order to achieve its national objectives. Right. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Jayanto Ghoshal. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, Please thank you. Me. Thank you, Mr. Gokhale. And uh, thank you, Shuho. Uh, I have enjoyed the conversation and it ignited my thought also. I have a very specific question that, sir, you uh, explain in your book that post Tiananmen Square, the realization of China after that uh, revolt and in a closed society, closed state. But now, post party congress, the third innings, is there any possibility of change in the uh, foreign policy of Xi, especially with special reference to India? And this discussion is on on the possibility of the Third World War, new Cold War regime. It's, a, it's, a, it's a all we are reading. But how you see the, our relationship? And just one sentence I will add, because we are also reading that the Belt and Road they are not that enthusiastic what they were. Now they have withdrawn their PLA in our territory in the last, that is their new development. I mean, the status quo, they also tried. And this Chinese economy also globally, when it is crisis, they are also not an isolated plan. So in this scenario, the plan of expansionism, South Sea, China, all those old concepts, is there any possibility of change and Rethink or what you mentioned that more aggressive policy to uh, uh, build up the authority of Xi in the near future. That is my uh, question, actually. Thank you, sir. Um, as I said, uh, it is likely that China will be more assertive. Uh, part of the reason for that is that it is now it now has the economic and military capability to do that, and it also believes that it has certain key interests to preserve, including its investments abroad, its energy supply routes, its raw material supply routes, as well as the markets for its own industry and, uh, and its businesses. So some of it is explained by economics, but there is also the sense, as I said, of an existential threat that they feel from the United States. And therefore, in some cases, uh, their foreign or national security policy, when it is reactive, might also lend itself to threatening the use of force and in, in some cases even maybe using limited force. Uh, that having been said, uh, it is very difficult to really predict what China will do or how it will act in the coming uh, years beyond saying that uh, what we are already seeing is a partial 
disengagement or, or a partial uh, decoupling on both sides, on the US side or on the Western side and on the Chinese side, and the greater securitization of the economy by the Chinese. In other words, uh, uh, one of the traits we can expect to see going forward is the hardening of the domestic supply chains. So that if there is a conflict or tension rises to a point where sanctions are imposed on China, it doesn't suffer the way in which it has seen Iran and more recently Russia suffer. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, their strategists are studying the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, on two counts. Of course, the obvious one is the military lessons to be learned. But the less obvious, and to my mind, the far more important study they are doing is how uh, the United States and the West is waging a financial war on China and what measures China must take to ensure that it insulates its financial system, its banking, its currency, its foreign exchange reserves, its trading uh, uh, system from uh, Western sanctions, which will cripple its economy. Now, as far as India is concerned, of course, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is we are in a, a troubled relationship. Uh, there has been a partial disengagement, but to my understanding, based on statements made by our government, it is not yet satisfactory from our perspective. There is the larger issue of de-escalation, which is the pulling back and reduction of the large number of troops on both sides, which has yet to even start being discussed and start to take place. So there is a while to go before a situation of normalcy returns. And there is a certain responsibility on China to bring that normalcy back. Uh, as and when that normalcy returns, how the relationship will develop is, is rather difficult to predict at this point of time or to speculate uh, at this stage. Yeah. Uh, before I ask the next caller, I would uh, take a question from the chat box. Uh, Nirupama, uh, she has uh, asked, uh, back in the last century, when there were two superpowers, the focus was on holding the ideological frontiers, democracy versus authoritarianism, capitalism versus communism. There were countries in each camp that had opted for one or the other ideology or had been won over by one or another means. Uh, when the wall came down and the Soviet Union broke up, it was proclaimed as the end of history. Uh, this century's conflict between the US and China shows that, hi that history has not ended. What is China's vision of its place in the world, particularly as it has no ideological allies at all and few that it can count in its camp, even in its own region? Rather, it has alienated all its neighbors and even whether where it has poured in money, it is viewed with suspicion. Mr. Gokhale. Yeah, thank you, Nirubama. I want to make two points. Uh, the first is this concept of the end of history is a very Western way of looking at developments in China. And one of the uh, arguments that I have always made since I uh, retired was that it is not good for Indians to depend on a Western perspective of our big neighbor. We need to develop our own perspective. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, the few Indians who studied China and wrote about it uh, were never of the view that uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, it would become a Western-led global liberal order that the rest of us would subscribe to. It was evident even in 1990 that China, uh, as well as India and a number of other countries, had their own ambitions their own expectations for their people, their own dreams, and that we would pursue those dreams. And that is what China has done. So uh, I think uh, your reference to the end of history is very timely in reminding uh, our fellow citizens that the West has usually got China wrong and not right. Uh, and that we need to therefore have our own views on China. Uh, the second point I do want to make is that while ideologically there may be no uh, 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 country which uh, is a brother country or a fraternal country, as the Soviet Union claimed when there, was, when, there were, when there were communist governments in Eastern Europe and large parts of the world, we should not make the mistake of thinking that China does not have friends. 
Uh, China has a lot of friends, friends that uh, owe China loyalty because of the aid and assistance given by them, uh, because of the political support given by them against uh, 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 onslaughts on their political and human rights records from the West, as well as support given by the Chinese in various other developmental ways. Uh, and we must also not underestimate the impact that China's remarkable progress under a communist system has had on the rest of the world. Uh, essentially, um, the Chinese uh, effort is to establish that democracy and development do not necessarily have to go together. This is the Western message. If you are not a democracy, you shall not develop. The Chinese message is we can develop without following a Western style democracy. And there are a number of countries who might not articulate this view, but certainly share it. So again, we must not make the mistake of assuming that because there are no other major countries ideologically aligned with China, that China is therefore friendless or allyless. In my opinion, China has many friends around the world. And uh, these friends, uh, uh, and it is evident in recent uh, uh, issues in the United Nations Human Rights Council, in the United Nations General Assembly, and various other places where, the, where China related issues come up, that it does enjoy wide support among the developing countries, even among many of the developed countries on many issues. Right. The next question is from Luhar Parth. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes you are audible. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, do you consider that it's now high time to follow stronghold policy with respect to China? rather than going for appeasement policy, which was recently seen uh, showcased by India where we abstained on UN meet on human rights violation by China. You know, Luarji, it's very difficult to comment uh, on such things because I don't have full information. As far as the uh, recent votes in the UN, UN Human Rights Commission is concerned, uh, we followed a principle. And that principle is, and has always been, by the way, not just under this government, but also under previous governments, that we will not vote on resolutions which criticize countries on human rights issues, individual countries. Uh, because uh, given the composition uh, and domination of the UN institution by the West, uh, it is entirely possible that further down the road, India could also become a target. And therefore, our position has been that the United Nations institutions are meant to bring about systemic improvement, not to corner any country uh, uh, and force it to uh, uh, adopt certain methods. So in that sense, I think that the analogy you are drawing is not entirely accurate because uh, it is in line with the principle we have been following. Uh, as far as uh, you know, uh, uh, the issue of uh, managing the relationship with China is concerned, uh, I think the government has uh, spelled out its position fairly clearly, uh, which is that there has to be mutual respect, mutual interests, and mutual uh, uh, sensitivities uh, that have to be observed. And the emphasis is very much on the word mutual. Uh, mutuality also suggests equality. So I think uh, uh, the policy has been fairly explicit in this regard, which is that uh, uh, we expect to have an equal and balanced relationship. Right. Uh, there are a couple of questions from Vijay Das, which are uh, interesting in the chat box. Uh, one is in BRI. Uh, the BRI has been a principal instrument of exerting influence of China externally. That is remarkable in its scope, but not a particularly profitable venture till date. How much of BRI do you think it's Xi Jinping's baby? How much opposition to BRI exists within the party and from where? And what do you think is BRI's future? I think the Belt and Road Initiative is part of a grand plan that uh, President Xi Jinping has evolved. But he has evolved this on the basis of uh, the enormous economic achievements and diplomatic achievements of his predecessors. 
which laid the groundwork for setting up this sort of a network to build global influence and global power, both to serve the Chinese economy and to serve Chinese diplomatic and national security interests. Now, while we tend to think that the Belt and Road is an exceptional uh, project, and in some ways it is, uh, let us not forget that in 1945, the Marshall Plan that the United States uh, established for the redevelopment of Western Europe after the Second World War also had similar objectives. The objectives were to promote uh, American economic interests, as well as to create a favorable political climate for the Americans in their struggle or their fight or their war against the Soviet Union. Uh, what the Belt and Road is doing is not very different from what the Americans did, although the methodology and the actual policies might differ. Uh, and therefore, I think we need to take a step back and assess the Belt and Road for what it really is. Uh, from our perspective, that is from the Indian perspective, where does that concern lie? The concern to my mind lies in the fact that through the Belt and Road, the Chinese are trying to compel others to adopt a set of technical standards, specifications, procedures, customs rules, quarantine rules, and so on and so forth, which will favor Chinese companies. And the flip side of that is, as more and more countries adopt those Chinese regulations, it becomes more and more difficult for Indian companies, Indian businesses to compete in those markets. So this is a matter which should be of concern to us. And it is indeed a matter of concern to us. We, India's government has regularly spoken out about these concerns uh, in public for the last five years. We were incidentally the first country not to endorse the Belt and Road. And there have, this has been subsequently followed by others. Uh, so my own view on the Belt and Road is that uh, this is a plan uh, which is part of a greater strategy of China to grow its power. Uh, it has run into some amount of difficulties because of uh, the pandemic and also because of slowing global growth and, uh, and Chinese economic growth. On the other hand, it is not entirely an economic plan. There are strategic elements to it and China has deep pockets. Uh, therefore, we should not look at this as either purely strategic or purely economic, but a combination of the two. And it is likely to continue uh, going forward. The next question is from uh, Kalpit A. Mankikar. Uh, so, hi, I'm Kalpit Mankikar from Observer Research Foundation. And uh, so my question is that, uh, see, the German Chancellor, there are reports that the German Chancellor will be visiting uh, China. Now, sir, in your assessment, does this represent a kind of a division among G7 nations in tackling the China challenge? What do you think of it? We must remember that Germany is not only the economic powerhouse of Europe, but it is among European investors, the single largest investor in China. And you have a range of companies from the heavyweights like uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, BASF, uh, and so on, right down to what is called the Mittelstand companies or the SMEs, which have been heavily invested in China which have made a lot of money from China and which still sees China as a significant market. Uh, since a lot of foreign policy is now economic, it therefore is entirely understandable that the new German chancellor uh, is making a visit to China uh, in order to defend what I presume are his own country's national interests. Uh, we have yet to see what he will say and do there. But we should bear in mind that the European Union has taken a much firmer position in terms of identifying China both as a partner, but also as a systemic rival. And uh, we have seen a hardening of European positions with regard to Chinese behavior in various parts of the world and on various issues. So the short point I want to say is that there are uh, good reasons, which I am sure the German Chancellor has in visiting China from his country's national perspective. Uh, in any case, it has never been the case that 
the West has been united completely in its views on China. Uh, for much of Europe, Russia is the immediate threat uh, because it really does not have fundamental geopolitical interests in East Asia the way that the United States does. It is not a resident power in the Western Pacific or in the Indo-Pacific the way that the United States is. Uh, and therefore, I think we need to take a more balanced view of Chancellor Schultz's visit. Uh, nonetheless, I have noticed that there has been substantial criticism of his visit, uh, including by uh, members of the German parliament and the German media and German businesses as well. So let's see how this pans out and what he says and what he does there. Uh, and I think we should keep an open mind on it for the moment. The next question is again from the chat box. Uh, there's a question on, you know, the Xi Jinping regime has for the first time in the party's history after China is opening up its intent on caging the high technology mega Chinese companies. There's a hint in the 20th party Congress outcomes that like other strategic sectors, science and technology would henceforth be a state guided endeavor. How do you think this would impact China's growth against the background of the Western campaign of decoupling from China. China has put an enormous amount of effort into research, development, and innovation. And there is no doubt that in a number of fields, they are at the cutting edge of technology. Um, anecdotally, uh, let me tell you, Shubhajit, that I was uh, uh, speaking to some, uh, I was in Boston last week. And one of the people I met was a Nobel laureate in physics in 2000, the 2004 winner of the Nobel Prize in physics for quantum computing. Uh, what he said was that until uh, 1995 or 96, uh, it was the Indians who dominated quantum physics in terms of high end research. Uh, today, it is the Chinese. In, uh, I'm talking of those in the United States that today it is the Chinese diaspora in the United States, which has replaced Indians as the uh, basic workhorse in uh, the high-end R&D, certainly in quantum computing. Now, in a sense, this hasn't happened overnight. It has involved substantial diversion of government funds into education and into R&D facilities. And this has been a strength of the Chinese economy. Uh, what I suspect the focus on bringing R&D into the public sector might do is it might uh, stifle or constrain or restrict these ties between Chinese and Western educational institutions and scientific establishments uh, to the detriment of uh, China's science and innovation. Uh, because really, state efforts to grow R&D through what is called as government guidance funds or GGF, as it is known, has not really succeeded in areas, for instance, like semiconductor chip manufacturing and design. Uh, a very large investment has gone into this with no uh, great success. Similarly, a very large amount of investment has gone into building a jet engine but so far, China, it has eluded the Chinese. Uh, it is really in, uh, in those sectors where there was a relatively free flow of information and personnel uh, between the West and China that uh, innovation has blossomed. So while uh, one should never underestimate the Chinese capacity to innovate, through history, China has been an innovator in terms of research, development, science, and technology. I think that the recent... Uh, uh, measures, if they are implemented, uh, in which there is a primary focus on public sector driven R&D, uh, would in a sense constrain their uh, scientific and technological capabilities. But, you know, this is just a hypothesis. We need to see how true this is. Uh, China has often uh, proved pundits wrong on many, on many levels. Right. There are a lot of questions uh, in the chat box on, uh, you know, the contestation between India and China and India's neighborhood. You know, uh, something that you, if you could tell us about, you know, in the last decade or so, you know, there has been contestation in almost all of India's uh, neighbors between India and China. And 
that has sort of posed a challenge to India's interests uh, in these in these countries. In uh, uh, many would say that you know China is trying to encircle India in the years to come, as one of the um, uh, viewers have asked in the question, Srinivasan Subramanian, he has asked in the question. And uh, there's a string of pearls theory that uh, the West has propounded. You know, how do you see this playing out as we go into China under a stronger sheet? Let me answer the question in this way, Shubhajit. Uh, in a globalized world, uh, should we not look at how far other countries have been able to maintain exclusive backyards? And if we look at it in that perspective, then the entire continent of Latin America, which was under the Monroe Doctrine part of the American backyard, has today a significant presence of the Chinese and the Russians. Eastern Europe and Central Asia, which for at least two or three centuries was dominated by the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, today has NATO and Western Europe pressing against Russia's borders. Northeastern uh, Asia, which for centuries was under Chinese influence and in cases like Korea under Chinese occupation, today has an American presence. And the South Pacific, which until 10 years ago was seen as Australia's exclusive bailiwick, today has the Chinese uh, uh, substantially present there. The point I'm making is that in the globalized world, there are no longer exclusive backyards. There are only shared spaces. And the key question is, how does India protect its strategic interests in those shared spaces? The question cannot any longer be, how does India preserve, preserve its exclusive backyard? Because in the globalized world where technology has taken us now in terms of weaponization of outer space and the ether, there is no exclusive backyard anymore. Uh, and therefore the question uh, is, uh, what are the measures we should take uh, to preserve our strategic interests in our neighborhood? Now, that's not a question for me to answer. That is, I'm sure, something that will be thought through by the government. And uh, in this, uh, the, the, the questioner's guess is as good as mine. Right. Uh, before I close, uh, I have a last question from the chat box, but I think it's a question that some people might ask. It's a very simple question that, is China a threat or an opportunity to India? Well, you know, it's uh, you don't conduct foreign relations in black and white. Choices are never in black and white. They are always in shades of gray. Uh, we must not look upon the rise of China as a disaster. For us and for the rest of the world, by the way, it has provided an alternative in terms of technology, in terms of financing, in terms of equipment, uh, which has broken the Western choke hold on the rest of the world, which was established when colonialism came into fashion. On the other hand, the pushback that the West is doing against China is also good for us. It introduces a sense of balance. Uh, and because the Chinese economy is substantial in, in across the board, in terms of both uh, markets as well as investment, as well as technology, it is an opportunity for us as well. On the other hand, uh, we must be conscious of the fact that we ourselves have through history been uh, an important civilization. We have always had core interests of our own. Uh, we should expect that uh, these core interests may not always be respected by other rising powers. And the one that is on our doorstep among the rising powers is China. Therefore, you know, it is there are elements of uh, cooperation and there are elements of rivalry. And it is a question of management of this uh, rather mixed picture, uh, which eventually is government policy. And, uh, and, and, and you know, I really can't add anything further to that, uh, except to say that we must not either demonize China or glorify it to such a great degree that we as Indians simply throw our hands up and say, well, we will never catch up with them and therefore why bother? I think it has to be in between. And that between means we deal with China as a threat when it is a threat. We take China to be an opportunity when it is an opportunity. Right. Uh, there is absolutely last one question because there are a couple of questions that have come on the Taiwan issue. 
some people are asking why is uh, uh, India not using the China uh, Taiwan card. Uh, Nirpama has put another question saying that India has been recalibrating its position Taiwan. There's a visit in the coming days by a Taiwan minister. What kind of response should we expect from China? And especially because uh, in, the, in the party Congress statement document, Taiwan has been mentioned quite prominently this time. So Mr. Gokhale, if you could respond to these. Well, uh, as far as I recall, Shubhaji, please correct me if I'm wrong. It is not a minister who is visiting, but a deputy minister for economic affairs. And this, by the way, is not the first time that such a visit has taken place. It has taken place uh, at fairly regular intervals since the year 2003, at least. Uh, perhaps the context is different in the sense of, uh, as you correctly said in the party congress, Taiwan has figured in a more uh, 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 with greater anxiety being shown by the Chinese. Uh, but in a, but we are simply following a practice we have followed earlier on the principle that we do not have diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but we have non-governmental, economic, commercial, trade, technological, scientific, and other relations which are important because this is an important regional economy. Uh, now, uh, whether the Chinese will protest or not is not something that I know, but if I were to hazard a guess, they might. Uh, in which case, our position uh, follows the principle. And, and I uh, presume that the government of India will explain our principal position and proceed with the visit. Uh, as far as what is likely to happen to Taiwan in, in, in the longer run, well, uh, uh, the, the questioners a guess is as good as mine. In that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gokhale. It was indeed a fascinating and insightful conversation on China. We really got a sense of the state of play, the history, the lucid manner in which you explained to us uh, and analyzed the developments with your unparalleled depth and breadth of experience. Uh, thank you to all the viewers from all of the countries. And uh, thanks to all of you from the Indian Express family for joining in today. Your questions, ideas, thoughts really enrich the conversation. For those, those who missed the session, video of this interaction will be online shortly. To read, listen, and view more of Indian Express's explanatory journalism, do log into our website, indianexpress.com. And my finally, a thank to, uh, uh, to our sponsors, Yojana IS. Until the next edition of the Express Explained Live, stay safe and stay tuned. Goodbye. Thank you, Shobhaji. Yojana is offering new batches for 2023, 2024, 2025. We are offering online and offline class English and Hindi medium. Our features are experienced faculties, mentorship program, round session and test series, online and offline mock test, current affair classes, study material and mock interview.